Tonight, as you know, we have a conversation, perhaps a debate, or even a master class, a trading of teachings um, about Genesis between two of the most distinguished members of the humanities faculty at Penn. David Ruderman is the Joseph Meyerhoff Professor of Modern Jewish History. I expect many of you know him as the longtime director of Penn's Cat Center for Advanced Judaic Studies, which he brilliantly nourished and shepherded for the first 20 years of its um, existence, establishing it not only as a vital center for Jewish studies, um, but as one of the premier institutes of advanced learning really in the world. And I see his successor, Stephen Weitzman, is here uh, tonight. Um, not that all that work uh, at the center and on behalf of its, geez, must have been hundreds of fellowship recipients um, over those years prevented David from occasionally getting a spot of his own scholarly work done. Um, it's actually kind of exhausting just to be an onlooker of his career as a scholar. He's published more than a dozen books, nearly 100 articles. His Jewish Enlightenment in an English Key won the Coret Award for best book in Jewish history. His Early Modern Jewry, A New Cultural History, won the National Jewish Book Award. It was in 2011. Some of his most influential work um, is in the area of the uh, scientific dimensions of Jewish intellectual history, including his 1995 book, Jewish Thought and Scientific Discovery in Early Modern Europe, which appeared in a new revised edition in 2001 and has since been translated into Russian. Uh, Peter Stallybrass is the Annenberg Professor in the Humanities, my dear colleague in the English department. Um, when Peter, about 25 years ago, and already very well-established uh, figure, redirected his scholarly energies toward the uh, material history of books and manuscripts, it kind of looked like professional suicide. <laughs> There was, at that time, practically no field of literary studies so widely regarded as retrograde and tedious. Uh, it, was seen, it was seen by many of us as a holdover from the bad old days of 19th century philology. Um, and Peter deserves as much credit as any scholar in the world for not just reviving book history, but rapidly transforming it into one of the most vital and stimulating areas of literary research and indeed one of the drivers of the so-called digital humanities revolution that's going on uh, as I speak. I dare say there's no one actively working in literary studies who's not familiar with Peter's scholarship. Most of it done as a matter of principle as well as practice in collaboration with other authors. Renaissance Clothing and the Materials of Memory, which he wrote with Anne Rosalind Jones, won the James Russell Lowell Prize, the premier award in our discipline in 2001. Uh, 2000. Since then, Peter has collaborated with Jim Green at the Library Company on Benjamin Franklin, writer and printer, and he's currently collaborating with Roger Chartier on a long span history of the book, from wax tablets to Kindles. I dare say by the time they finish that book, they'll need to go beyond Kindle <laughs> as well. Um, it's exciting to have these two amazing experts on early modern culture here for a public exchange of ideas about Genesis and its interpreters. Please join me in welcoming David and Peter. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Jim, for that wonderful introduction. Um, and it is really a pleasure and honor uh, that we have such a wonderful audience. Uh, but one of the things that I know, if I appear with Peter, I don't have to worry about uh, who's going to show up. You just do. So uh, I'm delighted to be uh, a part of this experience. Uh, I first want to tell you about how this idea has emerged. Uh, it has a history, uh, at least for me. I'm going to tell you my personal history of how I got into this and finally invited Peter to participate in this experience. Uh, this is not the first time we've done this. We've done it twice already uh, in Antwerp and Amsterdam, and we are doing it also in Frankfurt. Uh, see the world and you know, have a lecture. We'll travel, you know, they have a, a gun. We'll travel over that program all the way back uh, years ago. Uh, it actually began about 20 years ago, and it was the second year of the Cat Center, uh, and that was the year I invited uh, Roger Chartier for the first time. I think that was the first time he came to Penn. Uh, but I also invited Brian Stock that year, uh, and uh, Brian Stock was talking about um, recitation, uh, oral delivery, uh, in the Latin authors that he was working on. 
And I just heard from the mouth of Moshe Edel in Jerusalem about how uh, what he considered Torah Lishma, or uh, tr the, the translation is Torah for its own sake, that the Hasidim would sort of recite words and make sounds. And it sounded like Brian Stock's uh, uh, material. So I said, what if I brought Brian Stock and Moshe Edel, put him in a room, invited 40 scholars, <coughs> and let them teach their text to each other? <coughs> Brilliant idea. It worked. We had 40 uh, people here. I think Peter remembers. I don't know if any of the rest of you were here 20 years ago. Um, but it was magical. Uh, it was even more magical after the lecture because um, uh, they were all medievalists there. They were all friends of uh, Ed Peter and Brian Stock. And uh, they drink a lot. Medievalists drink a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so this was really an evening to remember. Um, if you could. Right. Uh, if, 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 um, after that, I said, it looks like too much fun. I want to do it. So after a number of years, I asked Tony Grafton. I said, you know, let's, we were supposed to teach a course together, which never worked out. I said, well, let's at least do one lecture together. Uh, and we've done this about six times. But it's easy. We're both historians, early modernists, and so on. Uh, Peter was a different story. I mean, I had to do it a lot with Tony to be good enough to ask Peter to do it with me. So I sort of graduated. I don't know. But I, as you see, I mean, I'm not a, a Bible scholar or anything, but I had to sort of fit into what, uh, what Peter wanted to do. Uh, but after doing it with Tony for a number of years, uh, Peter and I have tried it, and we enjoy each other's company. So this is a dialogue of friends. This is a dialogue of a literary scholar and an historian of material text with an ordinary uh, European historian who does intellectual cultural history. We are indeed both early modernists, uh, and uh, with all of these Jewish study scholars sitting in the audience here, which I didn't expect, uh, I want to make clear that I'm not a Bible scholar, um, but um, I do read the Bible occasionally. Uh, and at least I've gotten through the first line of Genesis. Uh, so uh, that's what we're going to speak about. So what I'm going to do, uh, and you know, uh, we, we sort of want to hand this up a little bit, so I'm really you're just here, but I'm actually teaching. My, uh, the, the idea of doing this is my fantasy of teaching Peter Stalybrad something. So he's actually my student for the next 20 minutes. That's the way we're going to do this. Uh, and then, you know, he can ask a question later on if he wants, and then I, have, <laughs> I, I, become, I become his student. Uh, and then, after we are finished with our little dialogue, then you can begin to question and criticize it. So that's really. Uh, the thing. So, you know, pay attention. <laughs> I just love to say that. Uh, so, let me begin. Uh, so, here, here's what I want to do, and I have, uh, it's pretty awkward to hold notes here at the same time, so I'm just taking a quick look. Uh, and hopefully I can, I can take it. So, we're going to talk about that uh, text right there. You're looking at a rabbinic Bible. I won't explain all the different versions of the rabbinic Bible, but for those of you that do not know, <clears throat> the rabbinic Bible uh, is essentially the text with the Aramaic translation with various medieval commentators. So you can see, for example, on this page, this is the... Right, uh, one to the top thing. Oh, right, 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 right. I, I, I'm, I'm really not as, as good at PowerPoint uh, as... as uh, in fact, uh, the first time we did this, I had no PowerPoint. So this is all very new for me, so you'll forgive me for this as well. Uh, but Rashi is over here, Ibn Ezra is over here, you see there commentaries go down on the side. Ibn Ezra, uh, 12th century Spain, Rashi, uh, 11th century uh, um, uh, northern France, uh, Troyes, um, and, uh, and clearly they, they are two of the most important. Uh, as these uh, rabbinic Bibles develop over time, uh, we have many, many more commentators, uh, and thus we have a panoramic, panoramic view of Jewish exegesis. Uh, already on one page, which is an extraordinary way of studying the biblical text. So here, uh, of course, is the first word, Bereshit. I will come back to that, the first uh, word, uh, in, in just a minute. Now, what I want to do is sort of run through, uh, you're paying attention. Yes. Yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, a, a number of texts. Oh, if I turn around, you're not going to be able to film me, right? I can't do that. OK, I'm going to sort of like this. OK. So if you stand to one side, people will All right, perfect. OK. So I'm not uh, uh, suggesting I'm going to be comprehensive with any kind of Jewish exegesis on this first verse. Uh, all, all I want to do is to point out uh, a few examples, a very small sampling. At the end, I want to teach a text which happens not to be even a Jewish text, 
but it is about cultural transfer. It's using Jewish exegetical techniques in order to teach a Christian text. And I'm referring at the end to uh, one of my dear friends from the Renaissance, Pico de la Mirandula. So I'm going to end up teaching him. But, I, I, uh, but because uh, of the pressure of trying to you know, do this with Peter, I had to, I, I had to add a, a, a few texts. Now these are texts uh, that some of you probably know better than I, but I just want to give you an idea of them. I'm not going to really study them with you. Um, but for example, um, uh, the kind of text that you can easily find uh, in the Midrash deals with the letter bet. Now, uh, Bereshit, the first letter of the Hebrew word, which is translated in King James in the beginning, or when God created the heaven and the earth, and so on. Bereshit bara, lehim the shamayim be'at the aretz. So, so here we have uh, um, uh, 26 generations. The Aleph, which is the first letter, that is the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Aleph is complaining, why did you start with me? Why did you start with a B? <laughs> and what nerve? So uh, Bereshit in the beginning, and so on. The world of foolish, uh, but God answers and says, tomorrow I will reveal myself and give the Torah to Israel. Then I will begin at the, with the Ten Commandments, which begins actually with an Aleph. So, Anochi, which is the first word. So, uh, cute, right? Uh, I'm sure there's a Hebrew meeting, but I don't get it. Uh, in, in, the, in the beginning, uh, another interesting text from Sefer Bahir. Um, again, the shape of the bet. So, Bet, you know, so it's closed on all sides except for one, uh, to indicate that God is the bayit of the world. Bayit is house, uh, so God is He is the place of the world, but the, the world is not His place, and so on. Uh, so again, we're playing uh, with the word, and in order to get this word, this verse in in, in uh, Proverbs to work, uh, you have to change ibaneh to yivneh. Uh, so God builds the house. Um, so, in, in any case, again, playing with the form of the letter. Uh, let's go on. Um, so here, I, I, what I do is I, I'm talking about several different categories of exegesis without really actually studying any of them with you. Um, what I did in the past was to talk about number four, but let me just mention Rashi, Ibn Ezra, Nachman, are all very similar on, uh, on, in, the, in the beginning, uh, the, uh, on the Torah with what kind of English is that? I'm beginning the Torah with creation, not with the first command. We, we, we begin with creation and not with the first commandment. Need to establish divine ownership in order to clarify uh, principles of faith. All right? Uh, and I, I'm not going to go into any of those commentaries, but I do want to say a word about four. This is a very long and interesting text. It's a text that I teach in my survey of Jewish history uh, from uh, Maimonides' Guide to the Plex. And here, and you will see this come up again and again. For most Jewish exegetes, the importance of this first text is creatio ex nihilo, creation out of nothing. In other words, that is really the critical idea. I'm supposed to be speaking to him and not to you, so forgive me if I keep looking, noticing that you're here. <laughs> um, in other words, uh, Maimonides, unlike other, and other, another exegete who later writes, I'm speaking about Gersonides uh, from the 13th century, he goes through the verse, Bereshit bara Elohim et ha-shamayim et ha-aretz, ha-aretz ha-etat tohu v'vohu. And the earth was, how do you translate that? Without form, void and without form. So, ha-ha, Gersandi said, that's Aristotle, that's, uh, that's Plato, that's eulic matter, that's unformed matter before God imprints his idea on the matter. Uh, and and Gersandi accepts that definition. Maimonides, on the other hand, together with Muslim exegetes and uh, Christian exegetes, uh, the notion of creation out of nothing is critical in order uh, for a definition of God and for a definition of the relationship between human beings and God. And therefore, he spends an enormous time explaining that this verse does not imply any formless matter that coexisted with God. And his argument, which is a very interesting, almost a modern argument, is that you can't prove, in other words, I can't prove to you whether God came out of nothing or not. But I can argue for inconclusiveness. We do, weren't around during the time of creation, and therefore we can prove from our own experience what is beyond our experience. That's basically the whole gist of, the, of this very long chapter, and it goes into the next chapter. So this is a very important aspect of Jewish exegesis on Genesis 1. Quickly, number five. Um, 
here, uh, I sort of copied this from somewhere, but uh, of course, this is a Kabbalistic explanation that has a very important history uh, in the history of, uh, of exegesis on, and here now we're talking about the word Elohim, right? Bereshit bara Elohim, God. The first, and we will talk about the two, the various names of God, but here it's Elohim. Uh, and of course, uh, for Jewish exeget ex exegetes, uh, using the Kabbalistic uh, uh, interpretation of gematria, if you add up the numerical significance of the word bereshit, you will come up with the exact same number of not teva but hat teva. You need the you need the hey because that's five, uh, and you come up with the same. In other words, God and nature are the same. Pretty cool, huh? So of course. Uh, 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 Jacob Wachter in 1699 argued that Spinoza got his pantheism from uh, Jewish Kabbalah. Uh, and there's a whole debate whether Spinoza was Kabbalistic or not, and so on and so forth. So that is also a very famous uh, uh, discussion. Uh, I mentioned my friend David Nieto, who was the Chacham, the Sephardic Chacham of the synagogue in Bevis Marks of London. Uh, he, was, he also uh, used this exegesis in one of his sermons in 1703. Uh, and he was accused immediately of being a Spinozacist, which got him into a lot of trouble, but he survived somehow. He wasn't a Spinozacist. Uh, all right, so I just wanted to give you a few of those. Uh, this is for Peter's sake, because Peter will definitely speak about uh, the various names of God. So how do Jews handle this? Well, they try as best they can to ignore the idea of the plural ending of Elohim, uh, because they don't want to get into, into Trinitarian questions. But of course, they're going to be asked. And what they do is explain the syntax and the grammar and to argue that indeed uh, Elohim, uh, Eloha, the singular Elohim, it is still a singular root, et cetera, et cetera. But here, of course, is a good example of, um, of, uh, of the two words. Uh, Elohim usually means, uh, it refers to the justice, the just aspect of God, uh, as opposed to Rachamim, the uh, uh, what's what's how do we translate the compassionate aspect of God, uh, and that's why we need in Genesis two four to supplement the word Elohim Adonai Elohim or the Tetragrammaton. Adonai is what how Jews refer to the Tetragrammaton Yud Hey Vor Vav Hey the four letters of God's name which are unpronounceable. So therefore, when they appear together for the first time in Genesis two four, you get Adonai Elohim. And what this does is to bring together these two dimensions of God into one, uh, uh, the, the just aspect, uh, tempered by the mercy aspect, uh, and thus, uh, as it is said, Adonai Elohim formed man in Genesis 2, 7, and so on. Uh, so that's, uh, that's uh, one more example. But now uh, I want to bring you, are we were here already, to uh, the, the early modern period. I have no idea if he looks like that. I found that on the internet, so don't believe it. Uh, looks rather, uh, I don't know what he looks like. Maybe that's my mom, he's confused. Um, anyway, so, Sforno, as you see, uh, uh, brings me into my own comfort zone of the 15th, 16th century Italy. Uh, a very important exegete of the Bible, uh, a philosopher, a doctor, um, this is not a brilliant uh, interpretation of Genesis 1, but I had an English translation of it, so I give it to you. Um, and uh, just some of the themes here are really quite, uh, he talks about time being created uh, here. He tries to give what I think is not such a strong uh, explanation of Elohim, uh, why it is in plural uh, as opposed to singular. Uh, it refers to all the origin of all the various visible and invisible manifestations in the universe. Um, and then he goes on uh, to explain Shamayim. Remember, Bereshit bara Elohim et Shamayim, and he created the heavens, Hashamayim, the Haaretz, and the earth. Uh, and he plays with the notion that Shamayim really refers to Sham there. Uh, uh, and he, as you see, he talks about. Uh, uh, a connection between uh, Shammai and the plural, uh, and uh, 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 connecting the, the earth with an orbit, or orbiting planet. So, uh, which ex expresses a kind of primitive understanding of, uh, of astronomy, uh, clearly uh, 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 geocentric uh, astronomy, uh, pre-Copernican, uh, but nevertheless interesting. 
But then I, I came across, and this is uh, sort of a pause uh, for humor, uh, I came across this on the internet, <laughs> uh, and we were actually singing it before. Does anyone remember this song from uh, Linda Carlisle? Heaven is a place on earth. You know, I've never heard that one. <laughs> anyway, this guy claimed, some rabbi on the internet, it must be true if it's on the internet, uh, that, uh, 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 that Sforno influenced uh, uh, this singer from, anyway. so it must be true, right, 1987. So I mean, you can read this stuff. Uh, so he's giving examples of plural nouns, you know, like shemayim oznayim are ears, enayim are eyes, raglayim, and so on. Uh, and therefore, so I guess Belinda Carlisle is right. Heaven really can be a can be a place on earth. I don't know I, I, actually how he saw, but I just showed you how that's exactly what she's saying. But nevertheless, uh, you know, it must be true. It was on the internet. All right, so let's move out of this. Now let's get serious. Uh, how much time do I have? I haven't watched my time. How long? How long? You said twenty, 20 minutes. minutes. I don't know how long yeah, I go. Well, the book on more than you got fifteen minutes. Okay, so I got to do this in five minutes. All right. So now we get to my friend Pico, uh, and uh, uh, that's what you're looking at, the English translation. And now, I'm not going to read you this text, but I've sort of outlined it in a way that we can make some understanding of it. So my last example is, I've already given up on Jewish exegesis and now turned to Christian exegesis. But it is Jewish Christian, and what I'm really interested in, and this is really at the heart of my own work on Jewish Christian relations, uh, is how uh, a sort of a mode of inquiry influences, in, in other words, it's clear to me that Jews and Christians were looking at each other's texts. Clearly, in the Middle Ages, Christians read Rashi and Ibn Ezra, and, and this goes right into the early modern period without any question. Um, Pico clearly was influenced by the Kabbalah, uh, and uh, what he writes in his Heptopolis, which uh, I actually brought it so I could show you the, uh, at least the old English translation, the Heptopolis is a commentary on the first 11 chapters of Genesis, uh, and at the end, he devotes a special appendix to the word Bereshit uh, in the beginning. Uh, and this is what I want to sort of finish with by explaining. So Bereshit uh, is up there, and basically the method of inquiry is what he calls Chochmat. It's not, it's, it's, it's a, I just didn't know how to write that well in Hebrew. Chochmat Hatzeruf, uh, Arts Kombinandi. Uh, uh, which is the kind of game which, if any of you have the small children you play before, how many words can you take out of another word, right? Mm -hmm. So what he does, of course, is pull out of the word bereshit. You see, even if you don't read the Hebrew letters, you can see what he does. So we get ah, bar, reshit, shabbat, bara, rosh, ish, shat, rab, ish, greet, tov. I know he's misspelling here. Uh, it's, not a, it's not really good grammar, but you know he's trying to make a point, so we, we can forgive him. Uh, so he writes down all these letters in this long appendix, and then he connects them together into a sentence. Uh, Av means father, of course. Bivar in the sun. Reshit is the beginning. Shabbat, rest or end. Bara, created head, and so on and so forth. Um, now, the other thing that's very important to know about Pico, so what is, what, what is the context very, very quickly? Uh, Pico is, uh, is working at the end of the 15th century uh, in, uh, in Tuscany. He surrounds himself with all kinds of interesting scholars. He is a great Neoplatonic thinker. Uh, he is part of the revival of this hermetic corpus of, of Greek, which uh, through his colleague Marsilio Ficino, uh, it becomes a very important way of linking Christianity with ancient paganism, and Pico is responsible for bringing in the Hebraic tradition as well into this wonderful composite of all religious cultures. Uh, it isn't exactly a harmony, it is indeed a Christian hegemony using uh, ancient materials, both pagan and Jewish, for the purposes of, of, uh, of uh, enlightening uh, a Christian audience, um, and clearly, uh, Pico, what Pico does is very controversial, and he is banned by the church, but nevertheless, uh, his important motivation is uh, indeed a very Christian, a uh, pious one. Uh, for Pico, as a good Neoplatonist, there are three worlds, an intellectual world, a heavenly and a corruptible world, and what he does is take all of these words from Bereshit, connects them together, so take a look uh, right down here. Oh, I gotta do this, because I've never done this before, this is really cool. Uh, see the red, is that me? Uh, for me, it's me. Uh, the father and the son, Ab Bevar, right? And through the son, uh, I guess that's the same thing here. The beginning and the end, 
that is the alpha and omega. Okay, Shabbat bara uh, created the head. Uh, bara, so the head, the fire, and the foundation. The head is the intellectual world, the fire is the heavenly world, the foundation is the corruptible world. Of the great man, the, mac uh, the macrocosm as opposed to the microcosm, right? Um, the uh, universe, that is, with good agreement, uh, namely the harmony of the three worlds all put together. Now, isn't that a brilliant exegesis on Rishi? All in that one word, we have the very foundation of Christian Neoplatonism. Uh, so to me, this is a wonderful example of cultural transfer, of, uh, of drawing from Judaism and transforming it into something Christian. Uh, those who have studied Pico's uh, Kabbalistic works um, uh, speak of him transforming a Jewish Kabbalah into a Christian one. Um, but what is clear is his deep appreciation of this method and its, uh, its tremendous source of truth. So I haven't given you much of a full picture. Are you still with me, uh, Peter? <laughs> I hope you remember all of this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but hopefully I've given you a little taste of both Jewish exegesis uh, and how Jewish exegesis uh, infiltrates uh, a Christian understanding of the world. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm moving very far away, in fact, from Pico. I'm not going to be talking about Pico at all, but I'll end up with Christian Hebraism. But what I want to talk about more are the kind of tensions within Christianity itself, about which stemming from the very first verse. Um, what's you know already been central, as already was mentioned by David, is this word Elohim, uh, because of it having a plural uh, suffix. So the notion of the plural suffix was going to be absolutely crucial uh, for Christians. And so the question is, who is God? Let's start with that question. Who is God? Who is Elohim? And it turns out not to be a very easy question, but the, the um, verse that Christians kept returning to was verse 126 of Genesis, because it is the point at which you get a plural. And God said, Fakiamus is the Vulgate. Let us make man to our image, Nostrum image. So here I'm working with the Vulgate, which is a Latin uh, translation of Jerome. This is the English Catholic translation, so I'll be using a lot of the time the English Catholic translation. But this is common, Protestants use the same translation. It's not a, it's not a Catholic Protestant difference at all. Uh, and then the annotation to the Moran's translation makes this clear. God first insinuated the high mystery of the blessed trinity, or plurality of persons in one God, signifying the plurality of persons by the words, let us make, and to our and the unity in substance by the words image and likeness, the first in the plural number, the, later, the, the latter uh, in the singular. So what's being emphasized here, which is absolutely standard Trinitarian theology, uh, is the notion that God is three persons, but one substance. So God is a unity on the one hand, but he actually takes the form of, of three persons. And so you get this out of this crucial word, let us make, fakiamas. Uh, and Elohim, the notion of the emphasis upon the plurality. So, if you try to take this, St. Augustine had written in his book, uh, De Trinitate, uh, at great length about how the, the Trinity is the model for, human, for, 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 for humans. When, when humans are made in God's image, he says they're made uh, in the image of, of the Trinity. But he, he's not thinking, in my view, or anything like this image of trouble-headed trinity. What he's thinking of is actually about a psychology, uh, and the psychology is about human faculties, one of the human, the human faculties. And he, what he says is that um, it is composed of memory, intellect, and will. In other words, a, a, so the a human being is a trinity in themselves, but it's a trinity of psychological faculties. The problem starts arising, and arose very early in my view, out of a visual tradition, and I can say a fair amount about the visual tradition, uh, really, about how does one imagine this to be? So this would be one imag imagination of God, one body, but three faces. That, uh, if you think of, in literary terms, persona, we actually use that word still, uh, the masks of God. Literally, it should be worth saying that the word person uh, is, from the, is from the Latin personare, 
uh, it's, it's a mask that you speak through, right? So the notion of person as being internal is actually a, a relatively recent uh, notion compared to this notion of a mask. So God has three masks of father, son, and what you find in the vast majority of early depictions of the Trinity, of which this is one, uh, there's a huge variety of depictions of the Trinity, I'm not going to get into this, but they are often depicted in the earlier tradition as identical to each other. And this is such an example where, you know, it, it, it's very hard to say who is the Father, who is the Son, who is the Holy Spirit, apart from, you know, seating arrangements. <laughs> Christ always sits on the right of God the Father. But still, which one is the Holy Spirit? Uh, it would be hard to say. Um, here you have the Holy Spirit very clear. In the centre, that's the Holy Spirit. But which one here is the Father and which one is the Son? And one of the things that people wrongly use to distinguish Father and Son are the halos. In fact, halos very typically, God the Father and God the Son, both have a, group, a cross in the background. You can see the cross uh, behind. And one point that I, I'm not going to develop today is essentially the notion of God the Father is iconographically incredibly marginal until the 14th century. It's very hard to find clear images of an elderly God. I put it a different way. I say it's, a, I say it's, a, it's fundamentally anti-patriarchal, that the notion actually of God, insofar as you depict God the Father, you depict him as looking like God the Son, not the other way around. Like here, look at the color of the hair, look at the beards. These, this, this is young middle age at the, at the elders. This, 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 the, these are not old people. So that God the Father looks like God the Son. This is God the Father with the orb because he's sitting on, on the, on, I mean, he, from his perspective, this guy's sitting on the right hand side. So this has to be Christ. Uh, but they look essentially identical. They're essentially identical. There's no dis clear distinction of age in their faces. And that's fairly typical. So if we actually ask the question of what is, you know, who is the God we're talking about in the beginning, in that first verse of Genesis, the first answer would be Trinity. The first the Christian answer would be the first answer in the beginning is the Trinity. And specifically, though, the question of in the beginning is already a problem for Christians because Christians have repeated this very verse, this phrase, in the Gospel of St. John. So that the Genesis begins, in the beginning, God <coughs> created the heaven and the earth. But St. John rewrites Genesis by saying, in the beginning was the word. Right, a completely different statement. So, in the beginning, in Judaism and Christianity have different meanings. That in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So, one way of interpreting this in the beginning is this is the beginning of time. You can interpret it different ways. There are very, very there are many different Christian commentaries on this. But one commentary says this is the beginning of the world, the beginning of time. But that's not the beginning in terms of God's time. God is outside time. So Christians would argue that here you get a new definition of in the beginning, in the, a second, a, 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 a much more fundamental beginning. And in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Uh, now we're dealing in Greek rather than, uh, rather than Hebrew. Um, and then the, this is the Latin that was predominantly used through the whole Middle Ages and into the Renaissance. In Principia, erat verbal. So, but this raises a problem, which is, okay, so in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. We've got the first problem, which is God, is that, is Elohim, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, is in all of them together. And then we've got a second problem, which is now John tells us that in the beginning was the Word, but what is the Word? So what is the Word that is in the beginning? And here we have a problem because the word is not the Trinity normally, not normally thought of as Trinity, because in John 1 14 it says, and the word was made flesh. So the word was made flesh is interpreted in standard Christian interpretation as the incarnation. So it means that the word is Christ before he is incarnated. Um, Erasmus notoriously retranslated logos, verbum, as sermon. Uh, discourse or conversation. And I think what he is doing there in using this word sermo as opposed to Jerome's verbum is verbum went along with a, a reading of uh, the word as Christ, whereas sermo, discourse, conversation, emphasized a Trinitarian reading. 
And a Trinitarian reading would mean that the word, you actually begin with a conversation to emphasize that God is plural. Right? That it's not just a one figure. It's, it's actually, it, you begin with a conversation. You begin with the Trinity. You don't begin with Christ. And so this is a, a New Testament we have right here uh, yeah, at Penn, a Wycliffe New Testament. What started interesting about these Wycliffe New Testaments, this comes from about the 1390s, uh, is that is this extraordinary way in which the text itself is being transformed. It goes against what everyone learns about the Wycliffe uh, Bible. The Wycliffe Bible is said to be a kind of proto-Protestant Bible which distinguishes text from commentary and gets rid of commentary. So it's said to be anti-Catholic. And in many ways, it, it, it was strongly opposed, it's anti-clerical in all sorts of ways. But nonetheless, what you actually find in many of these Bibles is the interpretation gets into the text itself. So here what it says is, in the beginning was the word, that is God's son. Mm -hmm. That's not there. <laughs> That's not there in the Greek. You know? So it's actually gone right the word straightforwardly into the text itself. That in the beginning was the word, that is God's son. Uh, or a more extreme case, this is in the British Library. Uh, in, in the beginning, uh, either, this is an abbreviation for or first of all things, was God's son. And God's son was at God. And God was God's son. <laughs> so God is, by the way, this is a plural, just a plural, you see a hyphen there. So God is son. Um, there's some attempt occasionally to show this is, this is commentary by actually underlining it. You can see there's an underlining here, which I've underlined here, and son down here is underlined. But by and large, it's very hard to say, but what this is emphasizing is the notion that in the beginning, right, what I'm dealing with is Christ. In the beginning is Christ. And so you're not dealing. So when we actually come back to who, who created the heaven and the earth, we already have one possibility, which is really what is coming through one dominant tradition, which is the Trinity. The Trinity. And yet that isn't the dominant Christian tradition. The dominant Christian tradition of how to interpret the first verse of Genesis is that. Well, I said, this, uh, this is the one I'm, I'm going to reject. This is a marginal tradition which shows the Trinity is Father. This is one which shows the difference of age, uh, unusual, Father, Son, and then the creation round the bad. Here again, this is later, 1485, by right now you're getting the God the Father very strongly. It's going to, and they're creating over here, up here. Adam and Eve, so that's the creation. And here you have just, you don't have the Holy Spirit anymore, but you have an identical, again, very striking, identical father and son uh, with the creation. Uh, but the dominant tradition is the son as the creator. And this is from two passages. The two passages are, first of all, from John. There are many other passages, I should say, that people develop, but the, the fundamental ones is uh, John 1, 1 to 3. In the beginning was the word, we've already seen that. All things were made by him, and without him was made nothing. So this is an ex so that's in a way already Pico. If you go back to Pico, what he's trying to do is father and son. He's bringing together in Bereshit. But I'd say that, and if you notice the, uh, are, you, are, are you awake, David? You might give a good. <laughs> <laughs> I know you might be fast asleep, my yeah. idea. So uh, do you remember what Pico said? What does Pico say about the father? Who, who does he think? In, in the son. In and through the son. Through the son. In exactly. and through the son. Right. The, the father in and through the son. So you see what Pico is doing there. He's actually developing exactly this, this tradition. In the beginning was the word. All things were made by him and without him was made nothing. So there is God the father, but the actual making of the world is in and through the son. The son. And this is John Lightfoot, the Harmony of the Four Evangelists. The Evangelist shows that the redemption was to be wrought by him by whom the creation was. Namely, by the Word, or the second person in the Trinity, as being fittest for that great work. So here it's explicitly non-Trinitarian, it's explicitly the notion that Christ is the Creator. And another very important passage is Colossians 1-15-16, to Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creature, because in him were created all things in heaven and in earth, visible and invisible whether thrones or dominations or principalities or potestates, all by him and in him were created, and he is before all and all consist in him. So this is absolutely the dominant visual tradition, and when you actually go through early texts that show the creator, this is a, a wonderful uh, example of a Latin Bible 
have actually we crossed we have cut off the no I haven't cut. So this is the I of N. Here's the N in. Here's the P of Principio, and the R, the R is missing. I N C I P I O. So in this one beautiful image, you have in Principio. But this guy here, judging by the colour of his hair, <laughs> and by also if you want to go with the with the cross in his halo, as I say, it's a problem because often called the father's representative here. This is it, it, clearly, to me anyway, a figure of the son as creator, the dominant tradition that goes through throughout the early uh, Middle Ages. Here, even more strikingly, you can see this is a beardless, a beardless figure, right? So again, definitely Christ uh, with the Gaelic. The, the, the cruciform halo, uh, you know, the crucial emphasis there. This is uh, in San Marco, based upon a 5th century manuscript, by the way. So although the date of the mosaic is 1215, 1235, you're looking at a much older iconography. The iconography uh, is from the 5th century. Um, so again, this is the notion of the sun as creator. And this is absolutely the dominant tradition, uh, including one of my favorite. This is in the Free Library here in Philadelphia. Uh, and it's uh, an extreme, oh, sorry, wrong, wrong way. You've got an extremely lazy God the Father, uh, who's doing absolutely nothing here in the centre, uh, very typically of a, a, a dominant Catholic tradition, which actually shows him as the, as the Pope. He's wearing the papal take tiara. So this is sort of God the Father as Pope, you might say. But who's doing the work? It's not God the Father, right? All the way around, it's God the Son who does the creation. So again, explicitly distinguishing a God the Father who, who, who rests you know, but he rests on all the days, not just the last day. He rests every day uh, you, because he's got a son who can work for you. Um, so the point I want to make is the son was nearly always depicted as the creator until the 15th century. And it's staggering uh, to, to me how little has been commented on this. So you've got a very, very powerful notion. But during the very period that David and I specialize in, you start getting a, a change. Um, and the, the, father, the father becomes the creator. And this is going to become the dominant tradition. And so here you actually get, very interestingly, a whole series of re-engagements with the Hebrew, actually. So there's a, a series of re-engagements. This is an early example from 1410. Uh, already what you've got here is a white hair. So here it's more about the color of the beard, very typical of what will become depictions of, of God the Father. But you have still got the cruciform halo very distinctive. I mean, I'm not saying, as I say, I don't think you can uh, decide that way exactly who, who, you're, who it's de depicting. And there's been many arguments that the figure, any single figure of God can represent the whole Trinity as well, so I should emphasize that. Some people argue that a single figure of God can represent the, the Trinity. But when you get to, like, to Michelangelo, it's very clear you're dealing with a very, very different God from the God that you're talking about in the early iconographic tradition. You're dealing with someone, so the beard, the, the whiteness becomes crucial, but also the long straggly beard. So you've got very distinctly the father as creator. And interestingly, this is not a Protestant Catholic difference at all. Protestants and Catholics alike uh, absolutely buy into this iconography. So this is a, a Bible in Lyon. You can see there that the emphasis here upon the Hebrew, Bereshit, right? So you actually got the notion of, and this is obviously God the father as the creator. This is a Lutheran Bible here at Penn. Again, absolutely clearly God the Father. Look at the beard, the sort of this distinctive uh, God the Father, and then the expulsion up here. Uh, one of the things that, you know, I just don't have, could have time to go into is the way in which Christianity massively supplements the Jewish scriptures because the expulsion, you know, who's this guy doing the expelling? Well, it's St. Michael. There's no reference to St. Michael whatsoever. Uh, just, he's not a figure. Uh, the figure's in the Jewish scriptures. So you've added St. Michael, and another thing I've got on at great lengths I won't do it here, is that Adam and Eve are being still naked. This contradicts the biblical text, which says that God has reclothed Adam and Eve uh, in furs. So you reclothe them before they're expelled. The whole visual tradition, the dominant tr tr visual tradition, actually contradicts the biblical text. Actually contradicts the biblical text. And here's another one from Antwerp. Uh, this actually, this particular beautifully hand-colored copy, uh, hand copy I found in Antwerp. Uh, uh, printed by Plantin, who did the Polyglot Bible. But again, look at the Father, very much the Father as creator. So the point I want to, you know, what I'm going to come back to and finish with very quickly is the Father was nearly always depicted as the creator from the 16th century when he was visualized at all. 
But what I want to finish with is that Lutherans, like Catholics, had no problem, by and large, with depicting God. So Lutheran Bibles, one of the things we tend to distinguish is Catholics from Protestants, but that's not the important divide visually. The important divide is between Catholics and Lutherans on the one hand, and, and uh, Calvinists and people Calvinistly, Calvinistically uh, inclined on the other. And it's about iconoclasm. Can, can you have images of God or not? And what emerges, I would say, very powerfully in England, rather paradoxically, because uh, James I, who we, we have the, the, the King James Bible, is often thought of as someone who has strong uh, problems with certain aspects of Calvinism. Nonetheless, the King James Bible is in one essential feature Calvinist, and it is that unlike earlier English Bibles, it excludes illustrations. It doesn't have illustrations. Uh, and this it follows the Geneva Bible, the Radical Protestant Bible, which insofar as it has illustrations, they're maps and images of Jewish um, ritual objects. So it's archaeological in that sense. It has maps of St. Paul's, but it excludes all images of God. And what you're going to find increasingly in Calvinist Bibles is the named but undepictable under God, the Tetragrammaton. And that's just what I'll finish with. So here is an example of how you actually get rid of God. Here's God the Father. This is exactly the same woodblock. It doesn't look like because I because I've taken this from a book. This one I've actually taken from you know this is it's, it's several removes from the original. But what they've done here was taken to England, uh, printed in a Protestant Bible, 1568. Do you see these are the rays up here of where God was? So it's called a plug. They've literally cut God out. It goes goes through here, and there's a rabbit. <laughs> so you have a rabbit and the tetragrammaton. <laughs> where God was before. It was actually, it was only rented this woodblock. I've been able to track the woodblock. It went back through Antwerp, was used in Antwerp. They put God back in again. They, got a, they made a new God and put him back here where, the, where the, he'd be pulled out. Uh, this, by the way, is the edge of God's rope yeah. up here. Yeah. So they put him in and they went back to Cologne and they, they kept printing him with God inside. So you could actually use, Protestants and Catholics could use the same woodblock. But here, a Calvinist interpretation, you cannot have an image of God. What you can have, you want, and you're also emphasizing at the same time, which is true, that unlike Catholic Bibles, this has actually been translated from the Hebrew, which it had. So you've actually got a range of Hebrew scholars. This is the Bishop's Bible who've been actually employed uh, to do that. There you can see more clearly. But this notion, this is a big image of God. It even goes into smaller images of God. This is a much later Bishop's Bible, and here you can see a tiny illustration of God. Uh, it goes all the way to, in this particular Bible, 1574, it's used 29 times, this same image. This is exactly the same woodblock, you know, if you see the break here in the side. So it's not a copy, it's the same woodblock. But what happens is literally in this chapter, God has been cut out. Why has he been cut out? A prophecy of the coming of Christ and destruction of idolatry. Right, so the notion that this would be an idolatrous representation means that the craftsman actually got his knife. And you can see just this halo remaining. So that's all that's left. And the final thing I want to look at is the way in which the go back to what um, the tetragrammaton and how the tetragrammaton emerges. Because I think one of the most interesting things that hasn't been really picked up on is what, exactly where David ended. We ended with the notion of Yahweh. Uh, that God has these two names. He's first of all God, and then he's Lord God. But the extraordinary, one of the most extraordinary features of Genesis is that the first two chapters of Genesis, this is the beginnings of modern, uh, modern historical scholarship, is that for modern historical scholars, typically they divide Genesis into two versions. There are two versions of Genesis. And the two versions actually have different names for God. So the first god uh, is Elohim, which is translated, in the beginning, God. That's the first god. But a second god, a different god, emerges in chapter 2. And in chapter 2, not anywhere in chapter 2, chapter 2, verse 4, the second half. This is precisely, literally, this semicolon here is where 19th century biblical scholars divided up the beginning uh, of the, the second version of Genesis begins right here in the day and it begins with a new God with the Lord God and look at the spacing L-O-R-D 
This is the amazing attempt of the, uh, of the Christian uh, Hebraists in the King James Bible to capture the Tetragrammaton, the literal four letters. It's a coincidence that the Tetragrammaton is four letters and you can translate it in English as law. And it's literally, you can see the way it's done, it's capitalized. It's not just done, so God is just capital G-O-D. But the attempt to actually capitalize, this had already happened in the Lutheran Bible, the same thing, hair, hair dot, and H-E-R-R, -R, they can capitalize. And you've got, again, a German tetragrammaton. So Lutherans did have before Calvinists, but by the time that Calvinists will really take off with this, the notion of the Lord God. And so uh, you've actually got this crucial distinction, Yahweh, Elohim, the tetragrammaton, uh, and then you can see it carries on after this. These are the generations. This, by the way, is showing again its Hebraism of the Bible. All of these words in smaller letters are interpolations by the translators. So they're not in the Hebrew. They're there to actually make sense. But it's marked for you that they're doing that. So they're actually showing what's in the Hebrew. Uh, that, here again, this word here. But the crucial point is that the early part is this God, and the later part is this God, God the Lord God. Uh, the tetragrammaton. So that's it, and we're open for the opening to your start. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to start with a question for Peter, uh, which is just listening to him and trying to think about uh, how do we compare what I did with what he, he does. So. Some of the obvious differences, it seems to me, is that, uh, number one, you have a lot of iconography, uh, and I don't. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe that's my own deficiency, but I, I think it, it also is an expression of the tradition from which you draw uh, this, this massive, uh, I guess, most beautiful uh, 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 illustrations of the biblical text. Um, but the other question is, and again, I, I gave a very small selection, and I'm not sure it is totally comprehensive, but it seems to me, if I were to historicize what we did, that um, for Jews, there are less dates on Genesis 1-1 than for Christians. Uh, a, a new theology is critical to begin with the first verse. The Trinitarian notion of God uh, and uh, uh, the Son as the Creator. I also wonder where is the, uh, the Holy Spirit. They don't, it has nothing to do with creation, unfortunately. It's either the Son or the Father. Uh, but in any case, uh, th this enormous weight is placed on, on this word, which is reflected both in the text uh, and in iconography. Mm -hmm. And the third element is that this exegesis emerges out of a lack of connection with the, with the original Hebrew in the first place. In other words, it emerges either in Latin and translating to English and so on other languages. So that it, it is, a, it is a, a biblical text which is framed within a different linguistic field altogether. Then your argument is, in the 16th century, something changes. Mm -hmm. And my, my question is, I mean, first of all, whether my interpretation is, is correct so far. But now, how much weight do we want to put on Christian Hebraism? Does the reintroduction uh, of the Hebrew text, or the introduction of the Hebrew text in the first place, really change the place of the Son in, now for the Father, and the introduction of, uh, of, of Elohim, uh, uh, Yudhe or however you pronounce it, Lord or, or whatever. Yeah. In other words, it, can we put that much uh, uh, interpret, uh, you know, yeah. force on the whole notion of, 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 of the introduction of Hebrew and not necessarily an encounter with the Jews, but an encounter with their Hebrew Bible? Right. Uh, and is this, is this the only way we can explain the transformation of this tradition in the 16th century? So, so God, there's excellent. <laughs> right, right. There's, there's, a, there's a lot there. I mean, the first thing to say is that uh, I do think that Calvinists and the Jewish tradition have one thing in common, which is at least a problem with how you represent God. I mean, right. there may be exaggerations on the side of Judaism about not representing God, but clearly there's a problem about how you represent God or whether you can represent God. And that was to be a perpetual problem within Christianity, although one that by and large was answered in favor of representing God. So that the dominant, um, you know, the, the dominant uh, West, Western and Eastern traditions of Christianity represent God, and you know, repeatedly do. Uh, and that then Calvinism is gonna really throw a spoke into that. And so to that extent, that's one question. Can you map that onto this other question? 
weakly, not strongly. I mean, first of all, Luther himself is already attacking. Luther has no problem with images, but he's still already mapping on new interpretations of, of the Hebrew, and he's insisting upon that. So there are two questions that, if we raise the question about Christian Hebraism in the 16th century, one thing to say is that, as you yourself said, Christians had engaged with, Hebrew, with the Hebrew text in various ways throughout the Middle Ages, more than we've wanted to believe. Um, a particular example of this are 13th century Bibles. The great period of the production of Christian Bibles in the Middle Ages is the 13th century. We don't really know. There are more Christian Bibles produced in the 13th century than the 14th century, the 15th century. So it's a massive <coughs> moment of production. And what a complete Christian Bible, they're often very small, they're pocket Bibles, what they normally had was at the back an index of Hebrew names. And these are extensive, they're not short, they're very long, and they are actual monuments of scholarship. They're actual people trying to work out what all the Hebrew names mean, what they... So that would be part of when, you, when, you, when, a, when, a, when a, a, a Franciscan has a complete Bible, that's what they will normally have, they will include. And some of their sermons will be an, ex an exegesis of the Hebrew name. So the first thing to say is there is you know, a huge tradition of Christian Hebraism before the Renaissance, no question. Nonetheless, the 16th century sees something completely new. It sees the development of professorships you know, throughout Europe, professors of Hebrew studies, uh, the King James Bible has committees with genuine expert, you know, people who really are experts in Hebrew, uh, and, printed Hebrew and printed Hebrew Bibles. So you're drawing upon a, a range of Hebrew knowledge of a kind that really wasn't there before. But also you've got this crucial thing that Protestants want to argue, not at all that they're innovators. They, the last thing a Protestant wants to argue is they're new, they're old. It's, it's Catholicism that's not novel. Catholicism is a novelty produced by corruption. And so what you want to go, you want to go back before Catholicism, you want to go back before the Vulgate Bible, you want to go back to the Hebrew Scriptures, you want to have Hebrew at your fingertips, ideally, so that you can undermine Catholicism. And so now Hebrew is not your enemy, it's not the Jews in here, the Protestants, their real enemy is the Antichrist. Who is the Antichrist? It's the Pope, right? It's the Pope. So the Pope is Antichrist, and if Pope's the Antichrist, then you can actually, you know, to this extent, it doesn't mean that there wasn't plenty of anti-Semitism, it doesn't mean that Luther you know, thought well of the Jews, of course not. Nonetheless, you're beginning to get the arguments that will lead to the reintroduction of Jews into England. People start actually wanting to have exchanges. You have many of the most radical uh, English reformers go to Istanbul, Constantinople, to actually go to synagogues there to learn Hebrew. Many of the manuscripts that are at Oxford actually come from Istanbul. So you're actually going to learn face to face in ways that are hard to do still in England, you know, hard to do throughout Europe, to have those open relations. And within, the, within an Islamic culture like that, even though you're not allowed to convert people to Islam, they have no problem about Jews and Christians interacting on an equal playing field with each other. That's fine. So you can actually learn these things there and come back to England with first-hand knowledge, you know, new manuscripts that you have. Um, so, I mean, what I would ask back of you is that what do you think the impact of this Christian Hebraism is, is back upon Jewish Hebraism uh, in the same period? And then we should open it up to everybody. Okay, that's, that's a big question uh, as well. Um, and um, just to, to begin to answer the question, uh, uh, I, I taught Pico, but Pico also has an impact upon Jewish thought. Jews don't miss the fact. First of all, there are a whole group of Jews that were studying with him, uh, and it's really hard to ascertain to what degree they taught Pico. They certainly taught Pico, but they also learned. They came away learning from Pico. Uh, a wonderful example is a, a figure that has been studied by Moshe Del and others, Yohanan Alimano, uh, who was a contemporary of Pico, older than Pico, and clearly knew more, knew Arabic as well, and so on. And, and taught Pico's, uh, uh, the, the Hebrew uh, commentaries on the Song of Songs. But on the other hand, if you look at his writing, you see to what degree uh, Pico's notion of ancient theology, of this kind of uh, cosmopolitan, this, this view of, of monotheism which transcends every particular ethnic culture, uh, has entered into his way of thinking. 
and a variety of other thinkers who follow him. So beyond Yagel, there are a whole group. Of, oh, Yagel is a guy that I wrote on who was a student of Alimano. And it goes on way, way beyond uh, this in, into the 16th, 17th century. So it is indeed mutual and sometimes hidden. Uh, but clearly, uh, uh, Jews are aware of this, the intellectual style in which they are living in, and they draw from it. And they are rather unclear how to react. On the one hand, it is flattering that Christians are rediscovering a Judaic tradition and are buying up books. I mean, the rabbinic Bibles are selling not only to Jews, but to Christians. Uh, and being published, of course, by Christians in the first place. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it's, it's kind of dangerous. What's going on here? Uh, Jews were the only interpreters of their tradition. Now Christians are reading these Hebrew texts and interpreting them in their own way, and that can get very dangerous. And therefore, they're already, by the 17th century, Leon Modena, for example, condemns the notion of Pico's reading of the biblical text. What is Pico? Pico takes Judaism and distorts it and transforms it into something which is un-Jewish. Uh, so it is clearly a mixed bag. One, one final comment, and that is that just as you pointed out that Christians were aware of Hebrew already in the Middle Ages, uh, Jews are aware, of course, of Latin texts, are aware of Christian exegesis uh, already long before. The Renaissance obviously enhances and embellishes this, but clearly uh, uh, long before. And particularly within the framework, and we really haven't spoken very much about it, this long tradition of polemical literature written by Jews to respond to the Trinitarian notion of Christianity and uh, transubstantiation and so on. So, you know, it, what's interesting about a debate is that it, it doesn't really enhance uh, a Jew, Jews. Uh, you remember your high school debating club. You learn both sides of the argument. You learn enough so that you can put down the other. other yeah. You don't have any appreciation of what the other right. is saying. You simply want to put him down. Yeah. But you have to know his arguments. Yeah. And that's what this literature often looks like. In other words, Jews know every fine point which Christians are arguing, but only enough to destroy or try to destroy yeah. the other position. But that, of course, that tradition goes way, way back to the beginning of the Middle Ages, uh, even earlier, uh, right up until uh, the 18th and 19th century, and, and, and we go. Anyway, right. We so we'll, we'll open up. Should we stand up so we can they yeah. can see us at the back of that? Absolutely. Way? So the floor is open. Yes. Yeah, Fred. Thank you both so much. This was wonderful. I have a quick question for Peter. Um, so if visual representations of God the Father and the Son are virtually indistinguishable for the century and even the halo is inconclusive. And is there a way that we can know that it is the sun that we're creating? And also, speaking of medieval visual representations of the creator, do we know how the creator figure is being represented? That's a really good. There are two questions there. So the first question is: if everyone looks like Christ, <laughs> how do we know it's Christ? Isn't it? <laughs> and that's a really good argument. It's one that actually art historians have addressed and have talked about. So that one argument would be that if you see the single figure of God, it can represent the Trinity. I would accept that, except I would say that, I mean, in a way I'm more using the retrospective version, and once you've got the figure of God the Father, mm. so from a later perspective, this clearly can't do for God the Father, that's the one thing from a later perspective. But the thing I'd put perhaps the other, I'd still put it this way around, I do think that you'll find textually, in texts, you can find plenty of evidence of a notion of God the Father. So it's not that God the Father is absent. It, what interests me about the visual tradition, which I suspect is uh, it, it's a radical Trinitarianism that doesn't want to have an age difference between Father and Son. If you have an age difference between Father and Son, it raises the question of does the Father precede the Son? And that's radical. It's radical to believe that the Father precedes the Son. So to make them the same age contradicts human biology, but reaffirms divine uh, creation, and divine creation as being simultaneous, that the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit are emerging at the same time. So I see this as actually coming out of the Nicene Creed and Athanasius. Uh, what's one of the most remarkable features of Christianity, you know, is actually how, how Trinitarianism, from, the, from literally from that moment at Nicaea, is the central question for Christianity. It's very odd, I think, for most modern people to realize that. The last person uh, executed in heresy in England was executed in the early 17th century, the first decade of the 17th century, as an anti-Trinitarian. 
Right, so that is the big debate through the 17th century. When people talk about atheism, they normally mean an anti-Trinitarian. Uh, and Newton, you know, is, is a Trinitarian, an anti-Trinitarian, uh, but, you know, very, very suspect and often trying to disguise it. So that was the first question. The second question you had is, but how was God represented in the, the, the mystery place? And the answer is, I don't know. And it's a really good question. And I think, I don't know what the evidence is. You may have an answer to that, whether he was represented but I think these are questions we need to think much more about. Because in other words, I do think that this is the period, uh, the 14th, literally from around about 1400 to around about 1600, when you're seeing a, an extraordinary transformation in which God the Son and the image of even God the Father in the image of God the Son, so we're looking at young gods, basically, uh, becoming very distinguished, distinct gods, one with a white beard, one with white hair, uh, and the question of how he was staged, how God was staged, would be a fascinating. I mean, unless we have evidence to the contrary, I would presume that it's unlikely it's going to be completely out of step with the with the iconography. You know, uh, so it, maybe we can find this out through things like stage props. Stage props are often things that are recorded, and so whether you have white beards, white wigs, <laughs> whether they're actually part of all, you know. Uh, what a stage, what a company would have. Those are the places I'd look for that, for, for the answer to Why did the Trinity develop? Because it's not <laughs> That was David's question, too. Why did the Trinity develop? I, I, I literally don't have an answer. That's plural, obviously. I, I, I particularly don't have an answer to the Trinity. Of course, you can see why Father and Son develop. So, in other words, that's right at the heart of Christianity, is the notion that uh, Christ is the Son of God. Uh, all of that I, I can understand. How do you get the Holy Spirit? And why there's a need for the Holy Spirit? There is, you know, I mean, what Christians will do is they'll say things like, well, uh, chapter, uh, chapter, chapter 1, verse 2 does say, and the Spirit moves upon the face of the waters. So that's in, so the Spirit, says the Spirit of Elohim. Yeah, exactly, the Spirit, the spirit of God. Right. So, but that would be, for Christians, that is, the Spirit right. of God right. is the Holy Spirit. Right. Yeah. So, you know, once you, but it's the other way around, it's clearly the other way around. I mean, you can't, can't find, in my view, you can't find the Trinity in the New Testament any more than you can find it in the Old Testament. So, for what it's worth, I'd say, you know, that it's not to be found there. It was an elaboration, and clearly I'd say that would be an elaboration in relationship to Judaism, very early, one of the earliest elaborations of a separate Christian identity would be the development of the Trinity as against a, a Jewish God. And so the Council of Nicaea, which really, you know, is, is, is an attempt to sort of substantiate that, um, and where Athanasius really uh, draws up the, the, the creed that is still used by, by most Christians today, you know, uh, so the Athanasian creed still gives you, I believe in God the Father, which actually says, maker of heaven and earth, which is odd, because that goes against what we've just been looking at. But, uh, and then it, goes, it, then it comes back to these other words about in and through. So whether God the Father is maker of heaven, but in and through Christ. So, but it, it, I, I haven't got an answer. <laughs> well, well, that's a bit uh, confused. If, if the Son, uh, well, if the Father can't uh, precede the Son, then how do they uh, explain the work around the, the uh, nativity? That's about his birth in human history. So the, the, the argument with Christianity is that uh, the word, God, God is, all, from the beginning, he's three people, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But the second person of the Trinity, the Son, enters into human history through the Incarnation. So it's a particular moment in which he enters into history. So it's a crucial moment for Christians. But it's not to say that he wasn't pre-existent. That's the beginning of his human existence. Uh, and so it's not the beginning of its existence, and that's what St. John is saying. In the, in the beginning was the Word, right? Before anything, there was the Word. And then he was made flesh at a particular time in history. So the incarnation is in such a particular time. How about uh, Galil? I have two questions to Peter. One is, um, I guess it's a question of semiotics. Do you think there is a connection between the fact that the, uh, God is called Lord God and that Jesus called Jesus Christ? That there is this period. Yes. Uh, of oh God. That's really interesting. Jesus Christ. God, I've never thought of that. I don't think. I mean, we should have some questions for, for David. We, should, we shouldn't do this all on the other side. No, that's fine. But we should, but if, we, if we go back, I mean, I certainly don't think it's. You know, 
This is really the, the King James Bible we're looking at here. This is the 1611 King James Bible. This is actually taken, this is all up on the website, by the way, at Penn. This is our copy here that I photographed. And so any, anyone has access to it. I, I don't think here that what they're thinking about is anything to do with Jesus Christ. I think they're actually following the Hebrew. Yeah. And I think they see what is indeed the case no, that. I was asking the opposite. What? Whether the Jesus Christ. Oh, I see the Jesus Christ comes back from the Lord God. Oh, I see the other way around. I don't think so. I think that Jesus Christ, uh, there's already a long tradition of the abbreviation of Jesus Christ. The, uh, so you see it often on top of the cross in medieval iconography and so on. So I think it's pretty well established, you know, that Christ can be, you know, I always can be called Jesus, can be called Christ, can be called the Son. You've got actually a range of different names uh, for him. So I don't think it's a formation coming from Lord God back on Jesus Christ. No. I love you in ballet, the way you were done. Well, I'd say, David who established this, I mean, it's, a, it's a wonderful idea of David. I have a question to you before I go to David. Did the Calvinists have any problem with the sun? With the depicting the sun. The sun. Did the Calvinists have a problem with the Catholics? No, no. Calvinists, yes. Yes, they did. They did not depict the sun either. Yeah, Calvinists didn't depict the Father or the Son. No, they didn't want to depict God in any of these forms. So strong, you know, strong Calvinists. But I think these things become very complicated. I think that there are brief moments of serious iconoclasm. By the 18th century, you can find, uh, you know, the very typical how children learn the alphabet in America is through this book called the New England Primer, which probably sold about five million copies in the 18th century. And there, you know, they actually reintroduce images of when you learn the letter C. It says, Christ for us sinners was crucified, and has an actual picture of the crucifixion. But Calvin would never have wanted that. I mean, Calvinist churches got rid of the sign of the cross. So it's not just the, you know, English churches did too. People think of England as sort of middle of the way. It wasn't. They actually got rid of the, the, only, uh, the only church in England in 1600 that had a cross in it was uh, Queen Elizabeth's own private chapel. She had a cross. Uh, but that, every, other, every other cross was pulled down. If I can um, have a dialogue with mm -hmm. David, very brief. Um, I, I think that the dialogic mode does not start in the Renaissance. I mean, you depict it sort of, a, you say there was this uh, polemic literature, I guess you're thinking of the Seton Saint-Michel, the polemic all, literature. All the way back to the second century. We were even further back, the fifth century, yeah. in Palestine. Yeah, no, of course. It's not polemic. There is the kind of exchange that you described in the Renaissance. I'm thinking of the Genesis rabbi, the record for, I would say, the, the repository of the Genesis interpretations in the Jewish tradition all along. Rashi, who you quoted, I mean, the Genesis rabbi, which is the 8th century in the Galilean part in the Caesarea, is his, is his main source uh, for the interpretation. And there you already have the dialogic mode, because if you think of the first chapter of Genesis Rabbah when they're discussing um, exactly that. It's, it's dialoguing with uh, John, what, uh, John uh, and the Word, because it has this description that God has before him the Word, the text, the Torah. The Torah is the blueprint. It, it's described as the blueprint of the architect, but actually the text is before God when he creates. So there is already the idea, I think, in, in Genesis Rabbah, they know about the word of John, and they say, yes, it is the word, but it's this word, it's the Torah, that particular word. So it's always very, very dialogical. Uh, I said that completely, Gandhi. That's, a, that's a wonderful corrective, uh, that, that clearly Jews are responding to Christianity, perhaps in more veiled terms, and we have to... Come, we need a, a Dalit to come along to really decipher that and to pull that out to see it clearly. But I guess in the case of the Logos, it's not so. It's not so obscure. It's there. And you're right. Uh, so there is, uh, you know, an imaging. And of course, you know, we want to go back earlier. Uh, I mean, there's so many uh, uh, moments where Jews and Christians, you know, the, the Haggadah, the Passover, and so on, where, where each are playing on the same image of each other. And, and, and of course, that, that's more polemical. Uh, but in, in any case, you're absolutely right. I would just argue that in the Renaissance, it becomes much more open, much more uh, the knowledge, the literacy of Christians who, 
you know, may know a few Hebrew words. Now uh, we are dealing with Hebrew texts and they are reading in Hebrew uh, and their knowledge of Judaism is so much more profound and similarly for Christians. But again, uh, it, it, it's, it, it depends. Uh, the Middle Ages has similar moments, Nicholas the Lyra and so on and so forth, uh, and of course back to antiquity. So your point is well taken. I mean, uh, each, each is aware of each other in almost every period uh, from uh, the, the so-called uh, uh, separation, which was never a separation, uh, right up into this period of time. Uh, but I'm, of course, this is looking at it through the eyes of the early modernists, of course. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to address myself to the Jewish side of the room. Uh, when, when you were, uh, I was curious about you. Jew. <laughs> <laughs> right. I was Professor Rudman, I was curious about your statement, your question to your Trinitarian teacher, um, <laughs> that perhaps there's more at stake for Christianity. I, I was curious about that because um, it seems to me that it depends who you're talking about. I mean, Rashi, his first question betrays that there isn't a lot at stake here, and then he has some pro forma answer. But for, for somebody like the other guy on the page, or some of the other guys on the page, not commodities, really actually pushes back at that. He says, this is the root of everything. And so um, I, I was just curious about that statement. Is, is that, does that arise out of the fact that, or that a lot of people characterize Christianity as a religion that has theology, whereas Judaism doesn't? Uh, uh, or would you re reformulate that? Right. Well, well first, I, I asked it as a question. I didn't okay. make it a statement. So I was asking Peter to give me the, the, the right answer. Uh, so I, I was not sure, just in terms of, of the material that he presented versus mine, it looked rather sparse on my side. Uh, but it could be that I just haven't done enough uh, spade work and I should be teaching Genesis Rabbah and so on. Um, it's, it's a very complicated question. I mean, clearly Jews have a stake in Genesis 1. Um, the, the creation of nothing is, a, is a, obviously a very big issue for Jews in the Middle Ages. Uh, but they're also quite aware of the Christian argument. Uh, you mentioned Nachmanides. Nachmanides' uh, commentary is constantly a, a, uh, a defense of the Jewish tradition against Christianity. I mean, he was not only a disputant at the famous disputation of Barcelona uh, in the 13th century, but clearly his commentary, it just reeks with, with polemical, uh, and, and all you have to do is read into his commentary, you see it's almost on every page. So already he is aware of the other, he's aware of the other exegesis. In other words, that's why it's so complicated to disentangle the two. One is, one, you define oneself against the other. Uh, and this becomes, and, and the way this plays out is through, is through these commentaries and so on. Uh, Rashi plays it much more you know, literally and to, you know, and rely more on, on internal Jewish sources. But depending on what commentator you're speaking about, Sworna was clearly aware of the philosophical debates in the Renaissance uh, in other places of his commentary and so on. Um, but clearly, uh, what, what an exegete is doing, as you well know, is uh, putting himself into trying to understand the gap between him and the text. Uh, and therefore, clearly, uh, if you read him carefully, uh, at least sometimes, uh, you get the context in which he is describing and so on, which often is a Christian context. So who puts more weight on it? Uh, Jews, Jews can be theologians as well. Um, but it seems to me, in terms of, of, of what, uh, what Peter was suggesting, um, right from the start, the, the critical Trinitarian definition is, is critical here, defining, placing the sun at the, the central uh, uh, aspect of creation and so on. These are really important points for Christianity. Uh, Jews need to parry them or to be aware of them or to respond to them, but the, this is not part of their agenda. I have a question about the gender, um, political perspective. When I hear about the Trinitarian, I feel as if Christ the Son usually trumps how we understand God, and we look at the depiction of it. It's always the male form. So we can talk just a little bit about the interpretation of the first chapters of Genesis and the gender and how it plays out. About, sorry, yeah. about gender. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I mean, there's, there, there's so much good work being done on that. Probably you know, the, the fundamental book, the, this kind of binding book, Jesus as Mother, where she actually talks about the gendering of Christ himself as a mother figure. And shows that both iconographically the notion of being in uh, Jesus's bosom, you know, which is a huge tradition, including actually very explicitly the notion of him as nurturing. Uh, and she's also emphasized all through her writing the notion of Christ as a very complicated male figure, because obviously at one level he's man, 
Um, at the same time, the emphasis is, is upon a broken, naked body, the opposite of how one normally imagines masculinity, so that the crucifixion itself is, you know, the, the two great moments, you might say, the depiction of Christ and the nativity, a baby, and then the broken body in which one of the long traditions uh, in Christianity, particularly strong medieval Christianity, is that what you should do with Christ's wounds is climb into them. You should actually climb into Christ's wounds. Uh, that was the last sermon that John, John Donne gave. It was actually knew he was dying. It was called Death's Cure. And he actually says in Death's Cure, there I leave you in that blessed dependency to hang upon him that hangs upon the cross. They're sucked at his wounds. They're bathed in his blood. You know, so the notion of sucking in his wounds, bathing in his blood, and then I forgot when it actually goes into the notion of climbing into his wounds. So the Christ's wounds are often uh, uh, talked about as doors, the, the, the door through which you enter uh, into Christ's body. So the fundamental thing I'd say about in terms of, you know, that's one tradition, but there are other traditions. And the other great book on, on um, Christ and, and gender, uh, I mean, there are many great books out there, but the other one was by our former colleague, Leo Steinberg, and it's called The Sexuality of Christ in Renaissance Art and in Modern Living. And what he's particularly talking about is 16th century representations that emphasize Christ's penis. And so they actually sum up to the Virgin Mary holding Christ's penis. And there the argument that um, Leo Steinberg makes is that the crucial thing is to show that Christ is fully human. In other words, it's against the heretical notion that he somehow took on some spiritual kind of flesh. And that's been a long debate within Christianity. So what he wants to argue I think he makes too much, actually, of the, of the textual sources. I think it's an example where the, the visual sources are way out in front. Of the, I don't think you can find much textual support for what he's arguing. But I think that the visual tradition itself has this incredible power uh, to depict and to emphasize Christ's masculinity in that sense. Um, uh, including, I mean, it's, it's an amazing book, anyway. So I think those are two, and there's been an argument, a debate, I'd say, rather, between Carrie Pine and Leo Steinberg. They debated each other. And, I thought that it was posed too much as my law. I think there are two strong traditions within Christianity around the kind of problem of the gendering of God. Um, there's a whole separate question for the gendering of Adam and Eve, which is a different question from the gendering of God. But that, that would be, we realize that because, you know, this year is, is, is sex, yes. is the kind of humanities forum of sex. And we thought, you know, how, how, how dumb can you get to be talking about in the beginning when we should be talking? Sex, yeah. uh, the sex of God is, I think, an extremely interesting question. Let me just add, a, you know, from the Jewish side, I, I don't know very much, so uh, I, I can certainly, uh, uh, someone else can supplement this. Uh, but it seems to me, uh, not until recent feminist uh, commentary on the Bible, do we really have any, any, any uh, consciousness and awareness of any serious way. And of course, much is made of, uh, in Kabbalah, of its feminine, uh, the Shekinah, the divine presence, and so on, uh, which, is, which is, of course, the later term. Uh, but it's not, it's not clear exactly what the, the Kabbalists meant in the feminist way at all. Uh, we have other words that you know, have, 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 may have significance here. This is for Jim English's sex year. Uh, El Shaddai, uh, the god of my breasts. Perhaps that's, uh, that's another word that appears in, in the biblical text and so on. But I don't know if that's what it means Zahar at all. What? Say that? Zahar in the Kabbalah Zahar in the Kabbalah of Zahar in the Kabbalah Right. So God so, creates, so, exact. God creates. Uh, yeah, Male and female, he, he created. So, in other words, he created the distinction between. Yeah. So that's very important, yeah. of course. Yeah. Uh, this is the image of God. Right. Don't forget that this is the image of God. Right. So, so but that would come God. after Bereshit, right? In other words, that the, the yeah. distinction. No, this is the right from the beginning. Right. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. And no, the first he was talking about the importance of of of, of Shiva Shivim, <laughs> that this was an autobiography of God. Yeah. <laughs> All right, there's, there's material. <laughs> I have a question for, 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 yeah. for Peter. Uh, were the Christians aware of the, um, the political uh, usage uh, of the Jews when they translated Genesis 1 into Greek? Good Lord, so you're, you're thinking back to the sector the yet. Yeah. No, because it, no, it continues up to, to, to yes, my, absolutely. Post, my, my postscript, yes, which okay. is um, uh, a 13th, late 13th century uh, Jewish philosopher in Byzantium, Shemaya of Crete, uh, who was a translator of Greek philosophers. And uh, in one of his texts, uh, he says point blank that the, uh, uh, that the Byzantines, the Christians, uh, do not understand Rashi. 
Right. At all. Right. You don't want? You don't want to stop. At all. Yeah. And so if we look back at the at the polemical aspect of it, yeah. <coughs> in the in the Greek translation, yeah. uh, we have uh, a polemic against the Greek philosophers, mm -hmm. Otheos and mm -hmm. Right. Like that clearly cuts away all of Aristotle's uh, <coughs> yeah. uh, <coughs> argument that the church continued into the 20th century along with our physicists. Uh, and uh, then he attacks with the poison, uh, his mate, uh, which is the vocabulary of the poet, who was the creator of mythology, right? right? And what does God do, the God do? He creates Uranus and Gaia, heaven and earth. Yeah. And they weren't, they weren't yeah. self, yeah. Uh, what do you call it, um, uh, self incubated yeah, no, the Christians were absolutely, all the way through the whole period we're talking about, were totally aware of the, of the Greek translation. No, of the Greek translation, but of the polemical aspects. The polemical aspects, some polemical aspects. I mean, the, the, the thing that all Christians were aware of is the, above all, was the translation of Isaiah. Uh, and the question of, because for Christians, Isaiah really is the crucial, in many ways the crucial book. Yes, exactly. That a virgin, exactly, that a virgin shall give birth. Now, of course, if you cut out the virgin, Christianity sort of doesn't become so miraculous after all. You know, if, the, if, a, if a young woman gives birth. So it was very, very crucial there to use the, the Greek version. And they kept appealing. So the Greek version, you know, was, was important at certain moments. And there are debates. One of the debates that's going to go through the Renaissance, a debate that actually is not uninteresting, is that one of the Catholic responses about using um, the, the, the Vulgate is to say that existing manuscripts of the Bible may be earlier than many of the Hebrew texts being used. So in any one period, there was, a, there was an argument to say, so there's, there's an earlier argument which says the Vulgate is itself inspired. In other words, Jerome has special inspiration. And so because of that, it doesn't matter if you find a Hebrew manuscript, it's going to be less inspired than, than Jerome's. So the translation is inspired in this case. But I think there's another more sophisticated arguments develop about which are the early manuscripts, which are more corrupt manuscripts, and some Catholics try to defend the Latin Vulgate that way. But there again, they'll appeal to the Greek, and they'll look at the Greek manuscripts, and they'll say, you know, which are earlier there. So they're aware of that. How much, I honestly, I don't know the answer, if you tell them gladly. So I don't know the answer to how much they're aware of the polemical aspect, but they're, one area they are aware of the polemical aspect that was always central is Isaiah. And one of the things I think that Christians haven't placed enough emphasis upon, particularly in the present, is that they haven't seen how much, how important the Jewish scriptures were. If you look at uh, Handel's Messiah, and the whole section, which is upon the Nativity, which is the first whole section of the Messiah, the vast majority of those texts are from, uh, the vast majority of the birth of Christ is from those eyes, not from the New Testament. He uses one or two passages from St. Luke, but essentially it's the prophets. And that's what you look for. And I think this is one of the crucial things that, that I, is a response to David's first question. I think it's a very fascinating one. I say in one sense, I do think, I would argue that Christians pay more attention to the first verse of Genesis than Jews. It's because, in a way, Christianity has to establish itself in and through the Jewish scriptures. So it, it's belated, exactly. So being belated, it has to look at this verse. And literally, get, and that's why, and St. John is already a planet. In the beginning was the word. It's not like he's thinking, oh, in the beginning, I'm just going to start another. He's thinking, that's what Genesis starts with. It starts in the beginning, and I'm going to start in the beginning. But I'm going to show that we know in ways that they don't know what it really means. So there's already a kind of argument. But of course, that's within the, the sphere of, of Jewish Christianity. It's, when, it's, when, it's written at a time when Christianity is still a sect of Judaism. So that's the other thing to emphasize. There's no such separate thing as Christianity right now. Um, we are, that's all we paid for. <laughs> 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 <laughs>